Blessed be our God forever and ever. Forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners, and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. First lesson comes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 52, beginning of the 13th verse. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up, and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them, they shall see. And that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised and we held him of no account. Surely he hath borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was as oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When we make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring, and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm appointed for today is Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And are so far from my cry, and from the words of my distress. O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, 
you do not answer. By night as well, but I find no rest. Yet you are the Holy One, enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Our forefathers put their trust in you. They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried out to you, and were delivered. They trusted in you, and were not put to shame. But as for me, I am a worm, and no man, scorned by all and despised by the people. All who see me laugh me to scorn. They curl their lips and wag their heads, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, if he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me out of the womb. Trusted to you ever since I was born. You are my God, and I was still in my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many young bulls encircle me, strong bulls of Asia surround me. They open wide their jaws at me, like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, all my bones are out of joint. My heart within my breast is melting wax. My mouth is dried out like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. And you have laid me in the dust of the grave. Packs of dogs close me in, and gangs of evildoers circle around me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. They cast lots from my clothing. Be not far away, O Lord. You are my strength. Hasten to help me. Save me from the sword. My life from the power of the devil. Save me from the lion's mouth. My wretched body from the horns of wild bulls. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Praise the Lord, you that fear him. Stand all him. does not despise nor abhor the poor in their poverty, neither does he hide his face from them. But when they cry to him, he hears them. My praise is of him and the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the presence of those who worship him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied, and, and those who seek the Lord shall praise him. May your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nation shall bow before him. For kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. To him alone all who sleep in the earth bow down and worship. All who go down to the dust fall before him. My soul shall live for him. My descendants shall serve him. They shall be known as the Lord's forever. They shall come and make known to a people yet unborn. The saving deeds that he has done. continue with our letter to the, uh, the epistle to the Hebrews. This is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, open my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but in encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John, Jesus 
went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with peace from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again Jesus asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus, and Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officers, and Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Ananias, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the woman who guarded the gate and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? Peter said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world in the synagogues and in the temple, where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. They know what I have said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Ananias sent Jesus, bound to Caiaphas the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. Those who were standing near the fire asked him, You are not also one of Jesus' disciples, are you? Peter denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with Jesus? Again Peter denied it, and at that moment the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, if this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and your chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. 
Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After Pilate had said this, he went over to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him. But you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged, and the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to the Jews, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw Jesus, they shouted, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take it yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law. According to that law, he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? You know that I have the power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore the one who has handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on Pilate tried to release Jesus, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. Pilate said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews. But this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and my clothing, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Mary saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his home. After this, when Jesus knew that, that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of his side and held it to his mouth. 
When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was a day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because the Sabbath was a gray of days breaks limited. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first, and of the other who had been crucified with them. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified to this, so that you may also believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, They will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission. So he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had first had come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloe, weighing in about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices and linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified. And in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Today is Good Friday. Today is the day in which we continue our journey with Jesus towards his crucifixion. As I was reading through the scripture for today's service earlier this week, the opening line in Psalm 22, which read, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As I read that, I just stopped in my tracks. I knew that that was going to be a moment to meditate and to sit and contemplate. Those words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In Matthew and in Mark's gospel become the last words of Jesus as he is dying on the cross. But yet for John's gospel that we heard today, Jesus' final words are that which say, it is finished. It is complete. Good Friday is a day in which we are given a unique opportunity. It's even a gift at times. We are given the gift of Christ Jesus walking the road to death. In our society, in our world, and even in our lives, death becomes this great shame, this great avoidant, this great thing by which we try our hardest to avoid, to push aside, to flee from. But today, Jesus takes us by the hand and walks us with his very life to the place of death, to the place of God. We hear from Matthew and Mark, we hear this very human, very physical, very spiritually drained and emotionally drained cry from Jesus. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The full depth of Jesus' human endeavor is on display. With great love, there is great pain. With great life, there is great suffering. And we find that in the gospel passages. 
And today, though, in John's Gospel, we do hear, we hear a different voice coming from Jesus. We hear a voice that has a deep well of faith, of knowledge, of trust, of hope, a deep sense of life. See, as Jesus walks this road to death, the gift he gives us is the truth about death. It exists. It is real. None can avoid it. None can hide from it. None can run from it. But there is something to be said for facing it, for walking into it. In fact, that is Jesus' invitation to us on a daily basis. And we hear in Scripture, Jesus says, If you are to follow me, you must take up your cross. It's a daily endeavor to face death, to face the cross. And as we face it, we have a guide. We have a teacher in Jesus the Christ. We have one who does take us by the hand and says, I too know that there is pain. I too know that there is injustice. I too know that there is betrayal. I too know that there is suffering in mind, body, and spirit in this life. But come with me anyway, Jesus says. See Good Friday as a good thing seems very contradictory. But what Jesus does for us in showing us the way of the cross, the way of walking into our depth of wound, says we are not alone. We do not take that journey by ourselves. But God in the form of Jesus the Christ goes with us. In John's Gospel, as Jesus gives his last words and is taken down to the cross and is prepared for his burial, have someone shows back up on the scene that we haven't seen in a while in John's Gospel. The Pharisee Nicodemus comes back. The very point of death, at the very point where he would want to run and hide and avoid, like we all do, pain, suffering, and death. Nicodemus walks into the fray. He walks the man who has died in front of him. He prepares him for burial. You remember Jesus' first encounter with Nicodemus. They have this great conversation about what one must do to gain life, to gain eternal life. And Jesus tells him that you are to be born from above. And Nicodemus says, how can one be born again? Second time, how can one enter one's mother's womb and be born again? And finally, at the point of death, we have the culmination of that lesson. As Nicodemus, along with Joseph of Arimathea, take Jesus to the tomb and place him in. It's another way of saying, let me place you in that arm of love, into that place where you will be healed and loved and forgiven and brought wholeness. The tomb has become the womb. Jesus says, take up your cross, die daily. In entering the death of so many parts of our lives, 
that is going to the new womb, the place for healing, the place for God to do what only God can do. So as Jesus is taken off the cross, placed into the tomb, we, like Nicodemus, are given an image and a lesson about entering into the sacred heart of God, into that womb where God alone will hold us in our death, in our pain, in our suffering. And we indeed be waiting, waiting to be born. Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent His Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved, that all who believe in Him might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with Him of everlasting life. We pray, therefore, for people everywhere according to their needs. Let us pray for the Holy Catholic Church of Christ throughout the world, for its unity in witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers, and the people whom they serve, for Mark our Bishop, and all the people of this diocese, for all Christians in this community, that God will confirm his, his church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose Spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your Holy Church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray for all nations and people of the earth, and for those in authority among them, for Donald, the President of the United States, for the Congress and the Supreme Court, for the members and representatives of the United Nations, and for all who serve the common good, that by God's help they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Almighty God, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility your dominion may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind, for the hungry and the homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, for the sick, the wounded and the crippled, for those in loneliness, fear and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt, and despair, for the sorrowful and bereaved, for prisoners and captives, and those in mortal danger, that God in His mercy will com comfort and relieve them, and grant them the knowledge of His love, and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer. Let the cry of those in misery and need come to you, that they may find your mercy present with them in all their afflictions. And give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all who have not received the gospel of Christ, for those who have never heard the word of salvation, for those who have lost their faith, for those hardened by sin or indifference, for the contemptuous and the scornful, for those who are enemies of the cross of Christ and persecutors of his disciples, for those who in the name of Christ have persecuted others, 
that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Merciful God, creator of all the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all who do not know you as you are revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray, that there may be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us commit ourselves to our God and pray for the grace of a holy life, that with all who have departed this world and have died in the peace of Christ, and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new and that all things are being brought to their perfection. By him, through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead, to your holy church, peace and concord, and to us sinners, everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign, one God, now 